Hello viewers. In my previous lecture, that is in lecture number 12, I had presented a step-by-step -step derivation for a method called L1 method that is used as a numerical method to approximate Caputo fractional derivative. So along with the step-by-step -step derivation of the method, I had also explained its MATLAB code. So I was asked a question by this researcher that can I make some videos on L2 and L2C methods for the Caputo derivative. So that is why now I'm going to present lecture number 13, it's part one. So in this part one, I will explain the step by step derivation for a method called L2 method to approximate the Caputo fractional derivative. So left Caputo fractional derivative is defined by this equation. Note down in this equation, alpha lies between 1 and 2. So when alpha is between 1 and 2, the definition for the Caputo derivative becomes something like this. So you will have to use the second derivative over here and the kernel has a power 1 minus alpha and the coefficient of the integral is 1 upon gamma of 2 minus alpha. So this equation 1 is the definition for the Caputo fractional derivative when the order alpha lies between 1 and 2. Now let's suppose that we have a time partition on the interval 0 to capital T. So you can see here that the initial point is denoted by x0 whose first value is 0. Similarly, the last data point xn is equal to capital T. So we have total n plus 1 data points or the grid points. And here we have chosen small h to show the time step size. Now, in equation 1, replace x by xn and if you do so, you will obtain equation number 2. After that, we have a property in definite integral, the property that I have shown by equation number 3. So if we use this property in equation number 2, then equation number 2 reduces to equation number 4. Alright, so we have now replaced xn minus s by s and here in the second derivative, s has been replaced by xn minus s using the property given in equation number 3. After that, we have the integration interval from 0 to xn. I have broken this interval into sub-intervals as you can see from 0 to x1 and then from x1 to x2 so on and so forth. So we have equation number 5. In equation number 6, I have used the summation notation in order to aid all of these terms that are given in equation number 5. So you can see that in equation number 6, we have a summation notation wherein the index k starts from 0 and ends at n minus 1. So if you replace, for example, the lower limit of integral xk, when k is 0, you will have x0, which is equal to 0, as you are given in equation 4. Similarly, if you replace upper limit xk plus 1, here k is equal to n minus 1, you will have the upper limit xn as given in equation 4. So you will be back to equation 5 and once again back to equation 4. So we can safely write down equation 4 in terms of equation 5 and equation 5 in terms of equation number 6. After that, we can approximate the second order derivative that was appearing in equation number 6. We can approximate it by a three-point central difference formula on the interval xk to xk plus 1 as follows. So you can see that in equation 6, I have now replaced the second derivative 
by this three point central difference formula and this formula is familiar to us from our previous knowledge of numerical analysis in classical calculus. So we have this equation number 7 now. After that, this it, h square, I have taken it common. So it has now appeared over here, 1 upon h, h square times gamma of 2 minus alpha. And we have equation number 8. In equation number 9, I have now taken this expression containing the functional values. Let me also highlight it. This expression, it has a remaining part over here as well. So you can see that we have the remaining part over here. So this expression had, has been taken outside of the integral since it does not contain the S term. And we have to integrate now S power 1 minus alpha. So that is why equation 8 has been reduced to equation number 9. After that, we can integrate equation 9 by power rule. So, if we apply the power rule, you will have equation number 10. Nothing else has been changed, just an integration has been performed. Now, using fundamental rule of calculus, you can apply the upper limit and the lower limit as well, while taking this 2 minus alpha outside of the summation sign. So, you will have equation number 11 after applying the upper and lower limit. We know from our previous knowledge that x k plus 1 is equal to k plus 1 times h. There should be x naught plus something, but x naught since we know that it is equal to 0, so we have k plus 1 times h. Similarly, x k will be equal to x naught plus k h. Once again, x naught is 0, so we have only k h. And we have this property of gamma function we can use. So if I apply this, these pieces of information into equation number 11, so equation 11 now reduces to equation number 12. You can see here the property gamma function property has been used. Moreover, if you replace x k plus 1 by k plus 1 times h, then h will also carry a power 2 minus alpha. Same goes here. So that is why you can see that the term h power 2 minus alpha appears over here in equation number 12. It has been taken common from equation 11 after the replacement of these relations. Fine, now move to the second um, next slide. After that, you can see that in the previous equation 12, the h power 2 and h power 2 both of these terms were appearing in numerator and denominator, so I cancelled them out. And then I have the remaining terms over here. So we have equation number 13. After that, equation number 13, I have written the bracket, this bracket as the first one. And then the bracket containing functional values have has been written. So note down here that how I have actually written the functional values. This is something that we should note down. So you can see for example I have f of xn minus xk plus 1. So here becomes the here becomes the subscript like n minus k plus 1. Okay. Similarly if you have f of xn minus xk this would become as a subscript f of n minus k subtraction of these two subscripts and finally for the third term so we have equation number 14 in this way now you can see that equation number 14 can also be written as equation number 15 if i open these brackets so i have simply opened the bracket in the subscript so it becomes n minus k minus 1 this is what you you see over here you have n minus k minus 1 over here similarly this n minus k over here and similarly you have the same n minus k over here and finally n minus k minus 1 here it becomes n minus k plus 1 so you will have equation number 15 
now in order to observe some some behavior of the terms i have now expanded this expression equation 15 has now been expanded by me by putting the values of this index k so i actually wanted to know what happens when k is 0 what happens when k is 1 k is 2 so on so forth up to when k is n minus 1 so here in order to observe the pattern of the terms i have expanded the summation notation so let's go to the next slide now you can see that after putting the values of k you will have this kind of expression so you can see that i have tried to explain it in a clear form by using different colors so blue color here you can see is when you substitute k is equal to 0. Similarly, this light black color when k is equal to 1. In this way, you will keep going on by putting several values and then you will reach at the last term when k is equal to n minus 1. So, you will be having this last highlighted term in equation number 16. So, term by term, if you open, you will have all of these terms as being appeared in equation number 16. Okay, so let's move to the next slide. Now, in previous equation number 16, I had observed that the term fn plus 1, that was being appeared just once. So that is why you can see the coefficient of fn plus 1 is 1. Likewise, the coefficient of fn, there were only two terms containing fn, so the coefficients were 2 power 2 minus alpha minus 3. So, this will be the coefficient for the term fn. In this way, you will keep collecting the terms and finally, you can see when you reach at f0, the first functional value, the coefficient of the first functional value will be something that I have just highlighted. So, in this way, you will have equation number 17. So now, finally, L2 method for the Caputo fractional derivative has been obtained. If I generalize, I will have the expression as shown in red color where the coefficients W sub k are now generalized by these five terms. So when k is equal to minus 1, look at this in the functional value what you will be having. If and if k is equal to minus 1 over here, you will have the term f of x n plus 1. And the coefficient of f of n plus 1, I had just shown you it was 1. So, when k is minus 1, the coefficient w minus 1 will be 1. Similarly, when k is 0, it will be f sub n. And the coefficient of f sub n, I just explained, it was it was 2 power 2 minus alpha minus 3. In this way, if you keep collecting, it is very easy to understand that how the terms behave for all of these values. So, when k is minus 1, when k is 0, when k is between 1 and n minus 2, including both of the endpoints, when k is n minus 1 and finally when k is n. So, you will have all of these five coefficients. So, altogether, altogether the method that you now see on the screen, this method is what we call L2 method for the Caputo fractional derivative. The MATLAB code for this L2 method and an alternative method for L2 will be discussed by me in lecture number, in second part of lecture number. 13. So, I hope you have understood the step-by-step -step derivation for the L2 method to approximate the Caputo fractional derivative. Your comments and your suggestions, your questions are welcomed in the comment box. Thank you so much for watching the lecture.